everyone. Welcome to NET Seminar. This is the first NET Seminar of this spring quarter. Just as a quick announcement, we have a lot more NET Seminars this quarter just because of how scheduling worked out. So there's basically one every week. So definitely check the schedule and make sure you're coming to all of these exciting talks. So today we have Nia Kuzugin from ETH Zurich. Uh, she's a postdoc researcher in the communication systems group at the Computer Engineering and Networks Lab. Before that, until July 2014, she was a research staff and PhD student at the Institution of Communication and Communication Networks and Engineering at the University of Stuttgart. And foremost, she's working on the design of transport protocols and is currently chair of the IETF RTP Media Congestion Avoidance Techniques Group. And so without further ado, here's you. Hi. Thank you. Nice to see so many people here. Um, first of all, um, as the room is not too large, if you have any questions to any of the slides, just interrupt me and we can try to, um, I can try to give you more information immediately. I think that's the best approach. Further, if I'm going to talk to speak, to speak too fast, because I tend to do this, uh, just interrupt me and let you know. Except you want to have, have this talk over quickly, so then you don't interrupt me this way. <laughs> um, so otherwise, I'm going to talk about um, low latency support. And I, I slightly changed the title from towards low latency support in the internet to for the internet because it's not all internet, internet. It's, it's also around the internet to make those things work. And it's also towards low latency support. So I don't provide you a full solution. I try to, to um, introduce you to some building blocks, which is a starting point to reach low latency support in the internet. However, I'd like actually to start at a little bit higher level um, of the problem state. And this might be very familiar to you as you work like in the transport layer, application layer, whatever it's done in the endpoint, like that's a that's a view you want to have at of the internet. That's the way it was designed at the beginning. You have like the network, which is basically done and routes the traffic from one point to the other point, and then you have like the endpoints communicating to each other doing all the smart things. Um, that was the original idea of the internet, and it worked out pretty well. It was um, we were able to develop a lot of nice techniques which are working out the internet at the beginning, at the moment, and which haven't been in people's mind at the beginning. So I mean, like voice is like one simple example. Unfortunately, it's not that easy anymore. You have like all those little boxes in the internet. For example, there are maps. Um, they are there. We we had like very long discussions if they're good or bad, whatever, but like you can't deny them anymore. They are there, they will stay, they have some purpose, um, but we have to cope with them. The, the bad side of NETs is that basically NETs restrict all the traffic to TCP and UDP. So that's one restriction. Then you have like firewalls, which might be even more restricted. Um, some enterprise firewalls just block UDP traffic because they think it's all spam, it's all the tech traffic. Um, and they might also look for very specific versions of TCP. They might um, block additional extensions and stuff like that. And then there's all the other kind of stuff where you have like accelerating, performing accelerating middle boxes like video transcoding, which clearly has a purpose if you want to manage your capacity in your mobile network. But it also limits what you can do but to a very specific protocol stack and very specific expectation. And then there's all kinds of different tunneling which shouldn't actually change the transport we're using. It should just tunnel, but sometimes it does, sometimes it introduces expectation, it does traffic management, and at the end you just don't know what you can use anymore on the internet. So at the end you just, I mean, you have to probe or you have to, I don't know what you have to do. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a real problem we see at the moment, like all the middle boxes which are there for a purpose, but limit what you can do in the endpoints. And so, like, my, my big research question at the moment is how can we deossify the internet? That's, like, what I'm worried about. I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> Hopefully, I will get one at some point. Um, this can translate to, like, a couple of other questions, like how can we support new services which are not well supported today? One case is WebRTC, so communication between web browsers, uh, which has usually audio and video traffic and has low latency requirements, but also needs a lot of bandwidth. So that's not well supported today. Or like another problem was deployment of uh, multicast TCP. The problem, problem uh, the protocol has been there for a very long time, but until getting it standardized, there has been so many discussions about what little boxes do and don't do and how you get this running in the internet, which was kind of painful. So in this talk, I basically try um, to talk to, to focus a little bit on low latency support itself. However, I want to keep your mind this like more high level problem because I will come, will come back to it at the end. 
Um, I have like those three things I want to talk about, which are all related to the latency and also can provide some input to the actual uh, solution of the problem. So one thing I want to talk about is ECN. Um, I've been working for quite a while on ECN now. It's, uh, it's was standardized in 2001. Um, it's around for a while, but it's hard to deploy. I will explain later why. But I also tell you how we maybe can make better use of ECN. Then I would like to talk about TCP Steel, a new conditional code scheme, which is um, not only designed for high speed support, which, which was the focus for a long time in the also focused on low latency. Then at the end, um, I, I want to talk about a very recent topic, protocol called SPOT, which we um, just you know developed as a starting point. And this is in the IETF to try to Okay, so if you want to have some support, label well, maybe support the network. You could have like this buffer flow. If you have the machine, you like this site is in a browser. So what you can do in the network. You know, like behavior, which is a little bit old school, but just for the purpose of demonstration, it doesn't matter. So, if you just use the conventional tool you use right now and you, you lower your threshold or your queuing delay, like this curve will look differently, and you will not be able to utilize the link any, any uh, completely anymore. Because you have to share that your queue is just empty. Because you have to have reduced your sending rate too much. So you want to make this running, you not only have to change the name, change something in your endpoints. And then if you actually change something in your endpoints, this is also just you know an example sketch. You could, for example, uh, reduce your sending rate less, but then would actually more often hit the capacity limit and introduce more congestion. One point where you can start is the CDN, which, which would avoid any packets drops, but you get an extra margin. I mean, for those of you who haven't heard of ECN, just a quick introduction. So there's an RFC out there, which I said is, it was standardized in 2001. Um, the idea is very simple. Um, if a router gets congested, instead of, of uh, dropping a packet because it's congested, you just mark it, and then the sender will reduce the sending rate based on this marking. Um, by when it was standardized, people started to implement it in all the um, operation systems, but at the moment it's basically off by the call, or it's always implemented in the kind of server mode, which means if somebody uh, opens a connection to you and wants to speak ECM, you will respond to it, but you will never ask on your own. So if, ne if ne nobody is ever asking, nobody will ever use it. Right? Um, there has been, and the server mode was implemented because there have been some initial deployment problems. And this says, like, initially, middle boxes would break. And by break, I mean they would even restart. Like, there were home routers who would see an ECN mapping and just restart. Um, less worse is that there are other middle boxes who would just drop any ECN packets. But also a problem. So, like, I mean, like, we started this whole initiative, it never got deployed. So, we somehow how it just got over it. We have optimized our networks now for load loss. And, like, you don't gain much by just enabling ECN at the moment. So what I try to say is like, if we want to do something with ECN, and there's a lot of energy um, in the IETF right now as well to actually make it useful, we also have to change the definition of ECN. Because currently the RFC defines it as drop equivalent. So when your router calculates a certain drop probability, it might check if you're ECN enabled and mark instead of dropping. It's like it's equivalent. And if you if you do something else, you can get, can get, can get, can get maybe more information from the ECN markings and can react more appropriately to it with their condition. And this is just an, uh, an intermediate slide because we did some measurements on ECN for those who, of you who are interested. So the good news is we tested the Alexa 1 million websites over um, a couple of, of um, basically over three years now. And we see a very strong increase of uh, the server mode deployment. So if you actually con connect to a web server and you want to speak ECN, they will respond to you. So it's now we have now 56%. And um, so that's the good news. 
And I think it's made mainly because of the default in the operation system, so people tend to update the operation system at some point, and so it's enabled. The second thing we try to figure out is what happens if you actually try to enable it by default on client side. And then the question was, are there still middle boxes which would, which would break your connectivity? And the answer is, there are very few, it's like 0.4%, um, and um, it's still more than zero, but it's not really a problem because if you actually implement the fallback which is specified in the original standard correctly, you will just send your second SYN without ECN negotiation, and then this will, will succeed in all 0.4% uh, of the cases, and so you just have a little bit additional um, set of latency. Linux is not implementing this, we have like a three-line patch, which we're trying, currently trying to get in the Linux kernel, which seems to be more complicated than, than we thought. Um, <laughs> actually, it's more than three lines now. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm very positive that you will do it. Um, and and uh, Windows and Apple uh, implemented, and actually um, Apple, they have a really smart technique how to get this to a very low level. And then like we also tested what happens if you actually have an ECN connection, can you actually single ECN and stuff? Uh, we've, we've seen all kinds of these things, so there might be still some problems, but it's like it's a small number of problems, a small number of random points where we saw any problems. And the good news is we also saw two CE markings, which we couldn't rule out the risk that it's actually real CE markings, that there was actually a router which would mark the packet as congestion experience. But I mean, we also didn't send so much traffic, so I'm, I'm like, I expect it to be the number zero, but uh, we will do further tests here. Can you remind us for the marking, is it the TOS uh, field or which is the uh, field that you mark on the packet? Sorry, Katie. How do you mark a part of the packet? Um, so if, if One you... One of the TOS features, can you remind us? Yeah, if you, if you have negotiated ECN on both sides, you just mark your packet as ECN capable, and then a router can put an additional. Yeah, so which mark. of the fields do you mark? That's what I'm asking. Which of the fields on the packet? Yeah. So you have in the IP header, you have P. Uh, you have two uh, ECN fields. Okay. And to just say that the packet is ECN enabled, you mark one of them, and the router can just mark the second one to say there's actually congestion. Okay. Yeah. What is your question? I think there yeah. are the two bits from the toss fields from the toss byte. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm asking. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's it's the two, I mean, like, it's the two easy entries. It's not from mm -hmm. the toss field anymore, but it used to be the toss field. So that's okay. where, where some of the problems come from. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. The study, how, did, how, has, it, uh, how has it been done? Because I would imagine that many of these mailboxes who are having problems with ECM are mostly, well, gateways and user at the, sitting at the user's homes. So, yeah, so I mean, like, I didn't put all these things. So we had um, three servers from uh, from a, a cloud provider, uh, and we ran from those three different servers in, like, in Singapore, London, and New York, the measurements to all of the Alexa services for a couple of, from several points, at several points of time. So the mailboxes that we find out is one of the yeah, end user gateways? Not the no, no, yeah, so that's actually something we're doing right now. We try to to use um, information from peer, peer networks to actually also test clients if they're easy and capable. Um, okay, and then as I said, there's also some activity on ECN in, in standardization in the IETF. So we currently um, specify something which is called aggregate ECN, which will change just the feedback from the receiver to the sender. Because right at the moment, you only get a notification that there is uh, congestion once per router time, but if your router marks the packet um, heavily, you never get to know how much markings there have been. So you don't have any notion about the extent of congestion. So that's something we changed, so we can use this information <coughs> for congestion control. And then there's also um, ideas about changing the semantics of ECN, so not do, having a drop equivalent anymore. One important thing is that for, for drop, you kind of you smooth your reaction on the on the middle box. You're not single immediately, you wait a little bit to make sure that your congestion is consistent, and then you start um, dropping packets. And like for ECN, this just delays our signal. We don't need this. We can signal immediately and we can decide at the end point how to react. Because we also don't have to, to um, half our sending rate, we can just step down smoothly. Um, so this is not very concrete, but this is something we're talking about in the IDS. Um, so um, yeah, so what we're trying to do is actually 
and as a kind of a new service based on ECN. So the simple <coughs> idea is um, there's not much ECN deployment at the moment. So let's just assume that everybody who uses ECN in the future also requires some kind of different service. And in this case, basically a low latency service. So that's like that's a way how to introduce a new service into the internet in addition to what's there at the moment. Um, to, to realize this, there are two possibilities. You can have basically one queue where you have where you apply two different kinds of uh, active queue management parameter sets to the decision when you mark a packet. So we tried actually the setup where you start marking earlier um, in your queue before you start dropping packets. But that only works if you also react differently, if you also re react, react less, um, because otherwise you will always um, react early and not, not get any of the capacity. The second approach would be you have two different queues. So then you can configure your two queues independent of each other. You have like one queue with a very small buffer and one queue with a large buffer, as you have it today. Um, but then the question is how to, how to realize the scheduling. Um, the second approach, there was a presentation at the ICCRG, Internet Congestion Control Research Group, at the last IETF meeting. So if you're interested in that, you can look up the slides. It was also a very interesting approach. Um, so we just did an uh, initial study of feasibility, basically, based on data synthesis. Because um, this is like also just a background study on how data synthesis works. They have a very similar goal. They want to keep, they want to have low latency in data center networks um, by keeping the buffer very low, having still a large buffer so small birds can actually use the buffer, but on average keeping the buffer very low and still maintain high utilization. And the approach they take is they actually have to, three, to change all three parts. They have to change all the centers, all the receivers, and all the network nodes. And that's of course only possible in a data center where everything under your control. Um, for the network nodes, they use this um, step function where they basically just signal ECN markings immediately very at a very low threshold. For the sender side, they use a different um, congestion control scheme where they react on the extent of congestion. I just put the um, formulas in here for people who are interested, but instead alpha is the extent of congestion, and you have like a, a weighted moving average over time about the fraction of the markings you have seen. So this ends up in behavior like this, where you only have like small degrees, and then actually if you see a full window of ECN margins, so there's heavy congestion, you will also have your window as we know with you. And then the third change is that you need better ECN feedback at the receiver. So that's very similar with what we try to standardize with accurate ECN, but their approach is a little bit simpler, so it does only work if you don't see any um, ad losses. For the internet, we try to get something that is more error prone. And what we did for an initial study, just to show the feasibility, um, is we have like this dual APM scheme. We, in fact, we decided to use one queue because there is a lot of um, existing switches and routers. You already have this weighted red where you can apply two different red pair parameters to one and uh, to the same queue. So it's actually possible to configure something in ex existing hardware. And we tried both approaches. We used like the Data center TCP um, step function together with like the normal red for the lost base traffic. And then we also use like a slope for the ECN based data center TCP traffic and a step, uh, another slope for the lost based real traffic, basically. And all we wanted to show that it is possible to have those two flows um, coexistent using two very different kind of congestion control coexistent in the same queue. And if you tune your parameters carefully, and this was like the two-slope approach, you see the picture here, it's, it's really possible that they share the capacity about each other. But like we played around with all these parameters just to show that it's possible in what the space is. That's not like the final solution yet. Um, so, but I mean like the same. So when you say tune your parameters, is it the parameters on the atrium side or on the endpoints side? No, it's, it's, like, it's like all this APM parameters. And actually what we figured out at the end is that at least if you have an equal amount of, of data center and non-data center p or it depends on like how much of the flows are data center and non-data center, um, you can actually have like a relationship between the minimum threshold here and this minimum threshold and that will give you all the other parameters how to configure to get this about equal sharing. But that also depends on the number of flows you have, which you usually don't know, so it's just, I mean like all we wanted to show basically is that 
both of the flows get some of the capacity. It's not that one of them will stop. How will the box in the internet know which is it? Um, so here we we only we assume that all ECN capable traffic also implements something like data center to congestion control. Because right now you don't have or you not really have any ECN traffic. Um, if you use ECN and you don't have something like data center TCP on your end system, then you will get much more congestion than usually, and you have hopefully a strong incentive to update <laughs> to another congestion and problem. Um, yeah, but I mean, that was like the, the initial thinking about it. So as I said, um, I I'm, I'm, I'm was saying like data center TCP like congestion and um, I don't think that data center TCP congestion control as it is needs to be the one. But you need to have some kind of congestion control which is optimized for smaller queues and maybe can also take this extent of congestion into account, use this additional information. And that's the point where, yeah. I have a question regarding incremental deployment because ECN, like you were saying, it's <coughs> possible. Today you won't get a lot of benefits, but you can get them progressively. Problem if you start using DCTCP and your routers don't support it, you'll get murdered, right? By that I mean your so, congestion control collapse. Um, no, if you so if you're if if you use data center TCP and ECN and your router doesn't support this, you get um, much fewer markings than you usually would get with data center TCP, and so you get a much larger share of the capacity than the cost traffic. So you beat all the other flows. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, that's the point where I would like to, start to talk a little bit of, of, uh, about TCP CS. Um, I'm, not, I'm not recommending this fully to use everybody to use TCP CS, but I think like the basic design principle of what I call scalable increase, adaptive decrease, um, is an interesting approach and it's important to actually keep in mind when you design a congestion control that you have to handle those small buffers. That's the important thing. So for TCP CS, as I just said, um, I, I had basically um, three, three conditions which I would like to achieve. One was low latency support, and by low latency support, I mean basically that you can handle small buffers. So your network operator can go ahead and just do the first step and configure very small buffers so you have low latency and you still be able to utilize the link for you. The second thing which you, which you have to take into account is high-speed networks. Um, so there exists a lot of high-speed networks congestion control schemes, which scale much better than the traditional TCP Reno, but they still depend somehow on the on the bandwidth delay product. So if you have a larger link, they will just get fewer feedback and will react um, slower. So in my approach, I try to to resolve this dependency completely and just be independent of the bandwidth delay. And then um, the first, uh, the third base, base part was that I don't require TCP fairness or fairness. Um, because it's really hard to realize um, for an end system, and it's also not given today anymore. Cubic is much more aggressive than TCP Reno. And the only way to actually release some, uh, um, introduce some kind of fairness should be done by the network. And I also think you should not have like a, a, an instantaneous per flow fairness as you would require with TCP fairness. You should have some kind of notion of fairness over time per user, which you know you just can't do in congestion control. So I'm not requiring it. What I require is that it's possible to to for everybody to grab some part of the capacity. Um, this translates a little bit more concretely in my design goals. So as I said, thin high link utilization, independent of the buffer size. Then I want to avoid any standing queue because that's just additional latency you don't need. I can't change because this is still, for, for now, that's still a lost space for me because I also wanted to keep compete with existing traffic. Um, so I can't change the maximum delay because that's given by how the operator configures its queue because to get a loss, I have to fill the queue. But what I can try is to minimize the average delay by avoiding extending queue. Then this is this, feed, uh, this fixed feedback rate, independent of the bandwidth. That's why I said like I should be fully scalable. Um, and then also very important for high-speed networks is to have to speed up very quickly as soon as new capacity becomes available. So if one of your competing flows stops, there might be a lot of capacity new or newly available. And I have to say this is the one point where TCP cubic does not, good do, does not do a very good job. 
it's much better than we know. We don't have to discuss this part, but it could be further improved. And then the last point is the configurable aggressiveness. So that's what I said. We should have a way to actually influence the sharing between different flows. And um, I actually decided that this should be a parameter the, net, the application should um, care about because like the, for the application, it's important how big the share is. If you, if you just get a too small share of your network and you can't perform your service, then you might want to be a little bit more aggressive for now, but be more friendly later maybe. Um, so how does it look like? So just this general principle of scalable increase, adaptive decrease. If you configure like your buffer to one VDP as you need it today for Reno, it will look exactly the same than Reno does. Um, but if you go for a smaller buffer, you actually have to have a smaller decrease here. So that's what the adaptive decrease part is doing. Um, but what I want to have, as I said, I want to have the strict feedback rate. So you want to have the same so-called congestion in top planes. And therefore, you also have to change the increase rate. And that's the part scalable increase is doing. Why do you want to keep the epoch the same? Because otherwise, if you have a, a higher bandwidth links, with TCP Reno or restriction schemes, this epoch gets longer and longer. So you get, get less frequency any feedback. And so you can, it it's, takes longer to react to any changes on the network. You said higher bandwidth links, you mean higher delay links? Um, sorry. Higher. Um, both, I mean, if, if you have a higher bandwidth link product, actually, it will. Oh, yeah, down. if either. So that's just, um, I mean, like, it's, it's giving more details, actually, the alpha calculation, so that's the packets you increase per round of time. It's really easy um, because you have, like, the, the um, increase threshold. That's basically the target value you want to reach at. So that's the maximum congestion window you've seen before. And then you have the congestion window after your reduction. Um, and you have this divided by the number of round of times you want your congestion um, epoch. So that's a parameter you can configure. And I've chosen this in number of rounds of times because I think that actually makes sense for something like the internet. But like in my, in my implementation, you can also just give a, um, a value like in milliseconds, you say the, the congestion epoch should be so, so, so and so many milliseconds. So that's also possible. But I think actually in the internet, it makes sense to round it to the round of time. You want to be a little bit more aggressive on short links than on long links, maybe. Um, and the decrease function that's very similar, you try to estimate your share of the of the queue, the packets in the queue, and you, you use your congestion um, window um, accordingly. That's very similar to what uh, TCP Vegas or all other kind of delay based things are based on. Um, I have this additional minus one here just to make really sure that I empty the queue. And that's a nice thing about this um, thing as well, because I always want to make sure I empty the queue. I can also measure the minimum round of time, hopefully every congestion epoch, and I can update if I if I don't see the, the or if I see a different one. So this is um, I have to make this thing work nicely. I have like these three additional algorithms, and one is called addition and decrease, um, and that's actually to really 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 make sure that I empty the queue because sometimes depending on what the competing traffic is doing, your estimation of the queue is not enough um, for the reduction. And there are still packets in the queue because the other didn't reduce at the same time or did reduce to less. Mm -hmm. And so you can perform additional <coughs> decreases during one congestion epoch without further congestion notification to really, really make sure you, you hopefully can empty the queue. Now you say, okay, if you if you reduce much more than the others, don't you get a lower share? And that's a nice part about scalable increase because scalable increase will recalculate your increase rate to still reach the same point than before. So you just be more aggressive afterwards. And that actually works quite not quite nice. The second part, which I identified as a, also a general thing, which you could apply to other congestion algorithms as well, is that I have a different phase, which I call fast increase, if your congestion window grows above this in threshold. Um, because then you're above the, the rate you had before, so maybe there's new capacity available. And you just try to increase your congestion window more aggressively to actually grab this capacity quickly. And then there's a third thing, the trend calculation, because um, scalable increase, adaptive decrease itself does not converge to equal, equal sharing. So it's very stable, the, the principle itself, if you just use it. 
and you start to flow in slow start, they will end up at some random kind of sharing. So like one has more capacity than the other one, but they never converge to equal sharing. To actually make them converge, you just need a little bit of randomness, basically. And that's what train is doing. It's not completely random. It's actually taking um, the previous knowledge from like where the train goes into account to make them con converge fast. If you have the same configuration with the same aggressiveness. Um, yeah, I have a couple of pictures for you to just demonstrate you a little bit more how it works. This is like a very uh, basic simulation where you only have one flow. So these are two simulations. Um, sorry, I have a quick yeah. question. Could you go back to the last sure. slide? Um, I'm sorry, that came up here. Uh, so for the additional decrease, maybe you could you repeat, how do you detect when you enter that phase? Okay, um, what I do is I know the minimum round of time from before, and if I decrease and I can't see it, then the empty queue is not empty. Okay. Um, and I can update my minimum round of time if I see the same round of time for a couple of, of um, round trips, because when I increase my window and the, and the round of time stays still stable, I know I'm now at the minimum. So then in this case, I will update. Thank you. So this is um, so this is the congestion window over time and the queue length over time for a very simple simulation where you only have one flow on a bottleneck. So these are two simulations. And all I want to demonstrate is if you have a different bandwidth, you still have the same distance, the same congestion period, basically, between uh, the congestion bands. So that shows that the scalable increase part, at least in a simple scenario, works very well. And then um, this next curve is uh, the same bandwidth than the blue curve, but more, um, more queuing, more buffer. Um, and it shows down here that you still empty the queue every time, so there's no standing queue that's also reached. And you can also see that there are a couple of additional decreases performed, because um, that's, like, that's a problem about the um, round of time measurement, about the resolution of the round of time measurement. But as you can see, or like, I don't have the number here, but it's still it's a very high utilization percentage. Even so, we have this additional decrease. And then I demonstrate the same thing for the more interesting part, where you have like a very small buffer. It still works. And then I have like just one more plot. I mean, I have tons of results if you're interested, but that's like the common case where people ask, does it work? Um, and that demonstrates that you actually can use this num RDT parameter to implement the capacity sharing. So like on the on this side, you have TCP Reno cross traffic. So now it's like two flows on one bottleneck link. One is TCP sealed and one is TCP Reno. And depending on how you set this um, parameter, you can either reach equal sharing or you can you know, reach whatever capacity sharing you'd like. And the same works for Cubic. Cubic is more aggressive than TCP Reno. So if you use like the same parameter where you had equal sharing before of 40, um, Cubic gets a higher capacity. But then if you get more aggressive, you can, again, share equally. So it's, I mean, this is like just very basic stuff, I have, as I said, tons of, of results. OK, so that's the part about TCP series. Now getting to my third part. Um, and that's about signaling from endpoints to middle boxes or signaling from middle boxes to endpoints. Um, and the way and, and why we came up with this uh, approach was Exactly what I started with in the beginning. We, we have really problems, especially in the ITF, to deploy new protocols and new protocol extensions. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of discussions. There's a lot of um, randomness or, or non or people who don't know what middle box actually do or might do, or it's like the, is there one single middle box in the internet that does it, or it's like ten thousands of them? We just don't know. But uh, we want to get out of this situation. And the problem those middle boxes, with the smart middle boxes is that they do make assumptions about information above the network layer, um, which they shouldn't do, and which might not be correct all, all the time. For example, like most of the middle boxes think TCP is my dash control. That is probably <coughs> mostly true, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, if you see a TCP header, you don't know what the end, end system is doing. Um, or like we really had somebody telling, telling us that he thinks 99% of the traffic of the UDP traffic is attack traffic. So it's really it's easy to block it. But we see more and more um, applications would use UDP encapsulation, so that would be pretty. Or HTTP is web traffic, that's also not true anymore. So the approach we're taking here is we want to have uh, probably UDP based encapsulation for inbound signaling to make those um, declarations and assumptions explicit to actually tell the network what they need to know 
and hide the rest of the information by encryption, basically. How does that? How does that address the, the problem that UDP traffic is blocked because it's considered attack traffic? Um, <laughs> see, I mean, like, that's actually our initial use case. So we, we, tr we try to talk to vendors who build this box and try to figure out, you know, how can we enable non-blocking, like that you don't block UDP traffic. And the first thing they told us, I mean, they want to have more information about the traffic. They want to know what the traffic is blocked. The very first thing they told us, we need to set up state for this, and it's really hard. So we actually like to know when a flow starts and when a flow stops. And that's like our initial use case. That's what we try to do. And then we try to figure out what are the additional information to make those things work. I see. So basically, you use this. <coughs> the assumption is that you is that uh, you use this as a mechanism to signal to the box that you're not a tra attack traffic. Anymore. But hopefully, they haven't decided to block you already or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like if the, if the, if the box doesn't speak spot, if it doesn't detect spot, you, you can't do anything, right? So, like, as soon as they upload data to the boxes to be spot capable, they might hopefully cooperate with us and actually take the spot information seriously. Um, but I mean, also, like, if we won't not we won't put a bit which says like I'm a tech or not a tech, right? That doesn't make sense because you need a trust relationship. <laughs> so, the kind of information we're talking yes, about we have that it's the evil bit, right? Yeah, <laughs> it didn't work so far. But it also said if you, if you see it, you have to break. So that's, it's hard to um, so um, the, we have some constraints on the information information we want to expose, and one of the, of the um, constraints is it has to be declarative. We don't um, we don't have any negotiation. We can't make event reservation or stuff like this. We only you know give you what what we would like to see and hope the best, and we will not assume that you actually will, will react to this information. So basically, instead of making event reservation, you just say. You know, that's the maximum or the average bandwidth I am trying to send with. And if this information is any useful for you, you know, do something with it. Um, then the next part is like, we don't require a trust relationship. If you need a request relationship, this will not be successful. This is not the right protocol for you. It's really just, you know, giving an attention or an assumption people can make. And then um, this has to be incrementally useful. So you can never assume that anybody's listening to you. You, if you don't understand any information, you just ignore it, and you can, you cannot require that like every hop on a certain path actually participates in this bug. That's just not possible. So we, this constraints, um, you know, narrow down the scope a lot of what we can do. But I think this is actually something which can be deployed and has some use at least, because we have seen a lot of attempts, especially in the ITF, that people want to see all different kinds of things, and it's really hard to get it right. And you know, if, if you can just um, get a, a benefit by lying, then it's not the right approach. Even if the thing itself, if you do traffic is attack traffic, I mean, what would they do next? Would they drop it the packets? I don't think so, right? You mean so when the routing thing that's a UDP if the UDP packets are like attack traffic, what do they do with it? So a lot of firewalls just block all I like enterprise firewalls sometimes just block all UDP traffic they see. That's so, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think. I mean, there's no like second stage. Minimum inbound traffic. Yeah, inbound, inbound traffic. Yeah, inbound traffic. But it's it's also not like core routes who do that. It's like it's somewhere on the border. Right. And Dropbox, which is supposedly a cool company, and the people making these decisions are like 22 years old. They just block all UDP. And you cannot override that as as, as a policy. No, I mean, I, I consult there. I, I ask them people much younger than me, hey, can I have outgoing UDP? Outgoing as well. Yeah, they block outgoing. Okay. Yeah, because um, my thing is an attack thing on the outside, right? So they like, just don't want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, probably women, I mean, like, the, the idea is actually that we talked with the um, middle box vendors. So, actually, what, what's important is that they put their default policies in this kind of block boxes to the right. Point right, so that might change actually something because people who don't think about it just use the default policy, hopefully. <laughs> um, so um, I just want to give you some background because we had like a very nice workshop in Zurich in January, um, um, based on the IAE Stack Evolution Program. So there is uh, the Internet Architecture Board of the IETF, and they are organizing programs where they want to perform some work, and there's a program on Stack Evolution. 
and we had this workshop. And one of the outcomes of this workshop was actually this um, SPAT idea. Um, and it, it's really motivated by, um, by needs we have in the ITF new protocols. And it's also motivated by the trend of increasing encryption because vendors are really worried that they can't get the information they need for their middle boxes anymore. And I mean, there are some middle boxes who actually do some nice stuff to them and try to help them with problems. Um, so now, as I already said, our initial use case, which is like the thing we really think we can, we can actually um, address, is just giving you fiber proposals where people said we need like the start and the end of the flow, and we probably also need a confirmation of the receiver that they want to have um, this, this communication, something like a um, SYNAC or like an open response message. Um, and, and we want to have this transport protocol independent. So that should be below the transport protocol. And so based on this information SPAT provides, you should be able again to deploy your new protocol where the, where the port number can be written at any point you want because uh, the firewall can completely rely on the SPAT information. And we have, just to make it more concrete, we have like this document which describes a prototype that's not set yet. Like we, we discuss all parts of it, but up to now it's really very basic. You have like this cube ID to identify all the packets which belong to the same, we didn't use the word flow because it might be more than what you think is flow or less. So to do the same tube, tube. You have those commands to open, close, um, and acknowledge a connection. And you have the C board field where you can, uh, which, where you can extend this header to provide additional information. And that's the point where I get back to low latency support because like, this is like my, my number one use case where I say, how can we use this to provide actually um, information if you can use in the network for low latency and like very simple thing would be like this one bit where I can say I want low latency service versus low loss service. So the low loss service is basically what we have today. And the low latency service could just be an additional service where, you know, a router which knows about that information might put you in a smaller queue. Um, so that's just an indication. You never know what will happen, but it would be very really useful if, if we had. <coughs> Other information could be that you can put a priority between tubes. At least for a web RTC, for example, that's a use case where you have an audio stream, a video stream, and a data stream. And actually, the most important part is your audio stream, then your video stream, and then your data stream. So these flows all belong to the same user, to the same service. And if you could finger some kind of priority between the flows, that would be useful. And like other things we've been just thinking about is maybe thing or something like your maximum delay, single hop delay, basically. So if your packet hits a queue that's already longer than what you need for your service to work, you might drop the packet at the receiver anyway because you don't need it anymore. So you can probably also drop it at the queue. This has implications of congestion control and we really have carefully think about it, but it's not here. And the other case would be something where the signal information from the network to the endpoint, where you also maybe say what your maximum queue length is, so you can actually put your jitter buffers correctly, or I mean, I don't know what you want to do with the information, but at some point it can be useful. Yeah. Sorry, the proposal is this to be a new IP protocol ID in lieu of UDP or instead of UDP? No, no, it's encapsulated in UDP. In UDP, Yeah, but it's also something we're discussing at the moment. So um, it's, it probably has to be encapsulated in UDP or TCP. And we try to figure out if it's actually a valuable approach to encapsulate everything in UDP because that would, would be the natural choice. Um, but we might need something like a fallback or a happy eyeball protocol where you can actually encapsulate it in one of the two, just to make it work everywhere. So there's a lot of points for discussion. In the worst case, I could just imagine that you'd have to encapsulate it in HTTP because that's the only thing that makes it through your firewall. I, 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 so basically, the main point I want to say is like, I, I think we're at a point where the transition to the latency support can happen by just um, introducing additional service to what we have right now to provide low latency. Um, the initial idea was to use ECN as an identifier for the service. But I mean, ECN would also be very useful for the service to provide more feedback about the congestion you have on the, on the, on the link. Um, I showed you some ideas about scalable increase, adapt and decrease which take low latency and small buffers into account when designing congestion control. So the step is really we need to change congestion control for the service. And I introduced into SPOT, which is this middle box to end and middle box signaling protocol, which could be an alternative for signaling and provide additional information. 
and uh, and I'm very very um, happy to look forward to what will happen in the space because it's really we just started this work in the IETF. We had a, a BOF meeting, so a non-working group meeting. We had very positive reactions to it. We had a lot of people who were interested in it, and so I hope this is getting something nice. Actually, we want to change the name because like calling it like potato is probably not the best approach. <laughs> <laughs> but like for now, it's called that. Thank you. So should we use Spud for the next version of Mosh? Um, maybe you wait a little bit. <laughs> wait for the new name first. <laughs> we got pushback. So Mosh has almost all the UDP payload is encrypted except the sequence number. And we got pushback from Jacob Applebaum and these like freak out people that having any part of the payload in the clear was a total deal breaker. And then having any sort of flow IDs you could correlate uh, the same flow coming across different source IP addresses or anything like that is a privacy leak, and the whole payload should be ciphertext, or else, uh, you know, spies are going to be all over you. So we are talking with people. So one of the feedback we got from the uh, from the bar was this, these privacy concerns. But actually, I can't share them fully because right now everything is unencrypted, right? So what we try to do is actually to allow people to encrypt their stuff without breaking the internet. Because if you just go ahead and encrypt everything right now, like all those middle boxes won't work anymore. And you, you, and that's actually a management problem, right? They are there for a purpose. So what we try to do is to really <coughs> distinguish between what information should be should be visible to middle box because there's a use for it, and which information should be encrypted and should not be visible. Um, I have I, I have two questions, but I try, I try to make it fast. Uh, the first one is about the CM. So it makes sense that you know you don't want to drop packets, you mark them instead, and dropping is just waste of time. Um, and there are latency benefits for the enclosed because there's no drop. But the way one difference that I is that when there is a drop on a flow, right? In addition to condition window backing up. The flow is also entering recovery, so there is this period of time where it is not sending to your IP. So if we forget about the end users and we start thinking about a, a queue at a bottleneck lane, and then if you think about different flows coming into it, right? Now, when certain flows are being marked and others are dropped, then the flows that are being marked are getting the space in the queue, whereas the ones that are being dropped are not. Right. What that means is, as more and more flows start marking, then the flows that are not getting marked will suffer more loss, which is maybe an incentive to start using the CN more and more. But I'm wondering, there are things like, you know, for instance, UDP, which is latency sensitive. There are things like DNS, SCMP, packet to messages, and stuff like that. that are also latency sensitive and you don't want to drop them. So um, on the other end, the flows, the long, large flows that are running, which are end-to-end, -end, they might be bulk transfers, and they might not be really that way. So my question is, while we are talking about adding explicit condition notification to TCP, is there any thought about making sure that other protocols, which can be actually living sensitive, to make sure that they're not um, unreasonably drawn up a day, you know, network. So the problem you described is one of the deployment problems with ECM. So um, that's well now. In fact, if you, I mean, it depends how complicated you want to design your router. So you could still try to uh, monitor flows and see if there is a right reaction. So if you, you know, if you mark packets for a certain flow and you see you don't see any change in their sending rate, and that's something you can monitor at your, at your router, you could implement um, penalties, but that's like, it's making things are just very complicated. So I think the, the easiest solution would actually be have a Q, two queue system. Um, this also has some problems, but uh, it's that's the thing which is the easiest to implement. At least. And also remember that even for all, even all TCP packets are not marked, only data packets are marked. So dropping, for instance, TCP ads might not be, again, the same, right? So, so, I mean, dropping X is probably not a problem because it's always accumulated X, but dropping a SIM is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, some routers try to avoid dropping SIMs, 
I'm not sure if this is the right approach, but it's yeah, definitely them from the same people. Uh, so the other question I think I have is basically when you mentioned the latency and other uh, metrics in this part, um, headers, is it going to work like the end systems, whoever has a flow, they are kind of configuring the, the queue management in the routers based on their requirements because then there could be conflicting requirements that are not. No, it's just, it's really just giving an indication what you would like to have. And then like the, the network operator can decide what to do with the information. So you never expect any actually. You just, you just provide this information. So actually the network operator has information, can do something with it, but if, if they won't, they won't. But if they do, that will work that way where the systems are gonna say, you know, I want. No, it's basically, so what you say is, if, so if if you um, if you for example say I'm latency sensitive traffic versus low low sensitive uh, loss sensitive traffic, and the uh, network operator has two queues, then the network operator just decides to put you in the low latency queue in the smaller queue. So that's all the network operator. But it might not. I mean, like yeah, it really depends. Or for for the case where you signal. Um, your maximum per hop delay, it's really just the case when the network operator has a large queue and you can't, need, can't use the stage any anyway anymore, you, the network operator might drop it immediately. Or not, you don't know. It's really, there's no negotiation, there's no contract you make uh, about what should happen, but at least the exchange information which could improve the situation. The issue of fairness comes back though in the, the TCP you know connection sharing example that you brought up, where in the absence of coordination among your your end hosts and senders and receivers, it, it seems that everyone might just either pick the wrong thing unintentionally or intentionally just try to get as much bandwidth as possible. So the question is how do you how do you um, sort of ensure some degree of fairness when without the sort of without cooperation or in the absence of uh, explicit cooperation, maybe because you have to be compatible with other implementations. But you have to avoid for queuing your queues so like with that, like that. Yeah, but that is the, the, the way to queue is only for those two different services. So within a service, you have different close competing rate and you might share a capacity somehow. So, um, my, so my answer as a researcher is I would like to see congestion policy in networks where you have like, I mean, the, the simple idea is you give like a certain amount of congestion volume for each user. And when the congestion volume is, is used, you just swallow the user. And that, that gives a lot of freedom to the user to decide, you know, this is very important for me right now. I really need like most of the bandwidth right now for a very short point of time. So I might cause a little bit more congestion than usually. Um, but later on, I don't have any congestion volume anymore, whatever, so I might be more friendly and give more capacity to others. So that's just an incentive to do this. Um, but anyway, I mean, so that, I mean, like this means, means congestion policy in the network on a per user over base over a longer time scale, because that's the right set of, of fairness I think you should have. So a very simple example is like you have two downloads and um, one is very short and one is very long. If you share the capacity equally for both, both of them will take a very long time. But if you schedule the short one first, it will be done, and the other one will take still the same time as before, right? So that's for sure. Yeah. Early so completion time. Yeah, I mean that's that's the point where I want to get to, and the only point and the only way to do it is to to get a notion of fairness on a per user basis, and that's the only way to implement it is in the network. Because like with congestion control, I mean you can anyway not ensure with today's congestion control that it's shared equally. That's something you have to do in the network. So there is there is work. So this is there's also work called um, congestion exposure in the IETF. That's a protocol to signal congestion from the endpoint to the uh, network. And based on this information, you could do congestion policing. If you're interested in this, I can point you to this work. But it's um, it lost a lot of a little bit of energy in the IETF because it's really hard to. I, there is an incremental primary strategy, but it's a long. It's a long vision. It's a very long time how to get to get this deployed. So there's not much energy at the moment because also there doesn't seem to be a real need because it just somehow works at the moment. I hope it will not break. When you say per user, like what do you mean by that, and how would some box in the middle of in the middle of <clears throat> the network know that a certain packet belongs to a particular end user or device or application? No, of course you have to do it at the border where you know what 
traffic is coming from each user. I mean, like this information is network providers monitor the user traffic for their contracts anyway. And that's the point we have to implement it. Any further questions? I have one more. There's, it's an annoying feature of TCP's congestion control that as your latency and round trip time increases, your sort of achievable data rate decreases. So my question is, can this scalable increase, uh, does that improve the situation or do we still have the problem? No, that's exactly um, addressing this part. Um, I mean, it, 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 so your, your data rate is, is decreasing because you're very slow of catching up. I mean, like at some point, if you have like three hours of time and data to transmit, you will reach the capacity, but you might never get there. And that's definitely where the scalable increase is. is I think that might be the best feature of the scalable increase is sort of getting rid of the, the tyranny of if I live in Australia, I have, bad, can, I have bad, a bad data rate to Facebook in the low park or whatever. Um, so, I mean, like this was really my initial idea where I started because like from, from a um, theoretical point of view, I thought that's just wrong. There must be a better solution. Yeah, yeah. But I also have to say like for most links in the internet, what Cubic is doing right now just works fine, right? Like as, as long as the internet as it, as, as, it is, as it is right now, it just works. So there's not a big need to change, <laughs> except to sit in Australia, maybe I should go to <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Mira again.